Welcome to Why Not Change the World, the RPI podcast. I'm your host, Jeannie Hedden Gallagher. For the next 20 minutes or so, we'll explore different models that are helping leaders in the public understand and predict the spread of COVID-19. Our first example was built by a researcher who discussed his work with my colleague, Mary Martialai. I recently spoke with Malik Magdan Ismail, a Rensselaer professor of computer science who developed COVID Back to School, a publicly available tool that schools can use to evaluate their reopening strategies. COVID Back to School is an offshoot of COVID War Room, an app Professor Magdan Ismail built earlier in the pandemic to provide projections for the spread of COVID-19 in smaller population centers across the United States and the world. We spoke about how these apps are able to model for smaller populations and what they can tell us. When did you start looking at COVID and what did you want to model? It was uh, around about March and I noticed that um, there was a lot of uh, modeling going on at some of the you know, larger places that, that were in this game, like uh, University of Washington. And they were mostly putting out you know, results for, let's say, the whole of the U.S. And that's, that was the focus on New York State. And what got me interested was, you know, I said, this, this thing really needs to be modeled at a local level, at a county level, perhaps, where, you know, people have different types of interactions, different mobility patterns, the disease might behave differently. And uh, what got me even more interested is when I looked at the data, um, I saw that uh, this data is, 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 is typical of, of real world data. It's very noisy. It's very dirty. It's very messy. And I mean, machine learning. And, you know, this is the, this is the sort of, of challenge that we, you know, we, we, we really look for when we're, when we're trying to, trying to figure out what's a good machine learning problem to address. And, and that's what got me interested to, to put out results that would apply at the county level so that decision makers at the county level could, could sort of uh, plan how to handle and uh, win the battle against COVID and, and also, you know, to, to, to sort of uh, apply robust and sound machine learning techniques to solve these problems. What is it about data from, from counties or smaller cities that makes the data so noisy and dirty? When you're talking about a small city, um, the, 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 the reporting of the data is sparse, so you get fewer data points. And also the, the reporting of the data is, um, is, is, is very noisy in the sense that you know, on one day you'll get uh, 32 infections reported and the next day you get zero and then the next day you get 40. And so this this sort of from just the from from the from the practical perspective doesn't make sense that how can you get you know zero infections on a day uh, surrounded by days with more than 30 infections. And this is this is one of the things that can happen with what we call small samples, small populations. So reporting is sporadic and very noisy. And, and also what is reported uh, could have a lot of error. Okay. And so how does your approach overcome that problem? So this is, a, this is one of the challenges in machine learning. So very often with real world data, we're faced with this situation of, of messy data, noisy and or missing. And the most fundamental techniques that we have for addressing such messy, noisy, dirty settings is to, is to use robust techniques, techniques that would be you know, robust to, let's say, very, let's say the noise or the missing data. This means that you, know, you, 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 you have to sacrifice to some extent the, 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 how accurate the model is, how finely tuned the model is, because a very finely tuned model to the data is very sensitive to things like, oh, if there was a missing data point, it would change a lot. And so what, 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 what I did was I focused on, on robust models for this kind of uh, noisy, noisy data. Um, and in this context, what it meant is you have to simplify the models. You can't go for the most realistic, most complex model that, that, that people would like to use in order to, in order to model disease spreads because you just can't uh, identify the parameters of this model from the data. So you have to focus on simpler models that you can actually identify, that you can sort of figure out what's going on from the data. COVID War Room offers tools for all 50 states by county and numerous international locations. What can they tell you? What, what are the basic predictions that we produce? Now, having, having learned across the data, we can tell you at, let's say, the, the, the given moment of time, the current current time at which you are asking for the prediction, we can say, 
you know, well, what, what do we know for sure? We know we know how many people have been reported uh, sick and 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 what the population of the region is and you know what have we seen historically with respect to how the disease was uh, was spreading and what can we tell you now we can tell you some of the things that are hidden so what's hidden so one of the things that you know people are, are are really interested in knowing is so we have a certain number of reported infections how many total infections do we have how many people in total were infected so what's the difference between these two the difference between these two is those who were asymptomatic or those who didn't get tested so those who got sick and we don't know about, and this is moving towards this concept called herd immunity. How do we figure out how much herd immunity there is? So we can tell you how many people have been sick and are currently perhaps immune. We can also tell you how many people are currently infectious. So what percentage of the population is currently infectious? And this is these are some of the things that are hard to get from, from the existing models, even those that operate on a more global scale. Um, and we can get this kind of a number at the local scale. Now, now, the fraction of the population that's currently infectious is important to know because that sort of tells you how dangerous is it to step outside. Because, you know, if, if a lot of people are currently infectious, there's a high, there are, there's a high chance that you'll get infected. Um, and then, of course, uh, what, it, what, what else can it tell you is it can give you predictions for the future. So assuming that the, we have the current state and assuming we know how the disease is behaving, we can then project it forward and give you things like what's going to be the peak, uh, you know, when will it when will it likely tail off, and how will how will uh, how will the spread behave if we if we reopen in this way or that way? So we can build predictions for what will happen in the future. Now, of course, those kinds of predictions have to be taken with a grain of salt because we don't actually know what humans will do, and that's the danger of predicting when humans are reacting in very violent ways to what's going on, like you know, lockdown and sudden, uh, uh, lo sudden lockdown and, and, and use of masks. So assuming that, you know, the behavior remains somewhat uh, stable and, 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 and people don't uh, suddenly change what they're doing, we can give predictions of what will happen in the future. And this is done at a county level uh, throughout the U.S. and also for international location. So then when did you start to build COVID back to school and how does it build on COVID war room? Starting around July, um, we were getting interested at RPI in, you know, what, what's going to happen when we reopen? And then the question became, how do we do it safely? And, um, um, and so, you know, certainly a, a school like RPI would be interested in sort of quantitative methods that could, could allow us to, to, sort of, to, to sort of figure out if whatever opening strategies we, we choose to use are safe. Okay, and that raised the question of can we use you know the, some of these techniques in order to to help us with uh, quantitative reopening strategies, um, and that's what led us to sort of consider and build COVID back to schools, starting in in at the beginning of fall, uh, at the beginning of the fall semester, around the end of August, we're going to be bringing let's say six thousand, let's say eight thousand students uh, back to school. Okay, so you know. Can we predict, can we figure out how many infectious individuals are going to be coming to school? Infectious and presumably asymptomatic, because if they're symptomatic, we wouldn't need to uh, worry about them. They would be quarantined. So how many infectious individuals would we, we, we be bringing to school? And what if we change the cohort? What if we said we're not going to bring all 8,000, we bring 6,000, we bring 4,000, or we bring them in, 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 a, in a variety, or may, maybe we should bring uh, students from these geographic regions and not those. So could we build the tools to answer that question first? And so COVID War Room gave us a perfect uh, diving board to tackle this problem. And so if we assume that we're bringing students from you know, all the various counties and, and countries in the world, and we know what fraction of the population from the region they're arriving is infected, we can figure out you know uh, uh, the expected number of students who were who are going to show up on campus infected, and so we built this uh, answer to this first question, which was the beginnings of COVID back to school, and this this uh, so, sort of allowed us to 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 sort of figure out how many infected individuals would be coming, given the the decision to bring in you know a cohort of size approximately six thousand, you know. We, we, we were able to figure out that, you know, using the COVID war room results, we're expecting, uh, you know, maybe less than uh, 20 students to, 
to becoming infected. And I believe when we were testing, we, we found the number to be approximately two. So the, the model was, you know, uh, giving results that were actionable. Okay. And that allowed us to sort of uh, build, uh, 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 to sort of have comfort in the fact that, you know, we're not going to be bringing hundreds of students who are infected to campus. You know, it, it's order of at most, let's say, 10 or 20. And so we could build, let's say, you know, uh, quarantining facilities and beds and so on and so forth for such students in, in the event that they arrive. So that was the first question we wanted to answer. And then the second question that we wanted to answer was, OK, now that we can figure out how many students are coming to campus infected, can we figure out how the infection will, will progress? Given, you know, how students will be interacting and moving around and going to classes and going for meals and so on and so forth. Okay. And that's essentially what COVID back to school does. COVID back to school allows us to sort of model and, 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 and predict how the disease will spread, assuming it starts from, let's say, one, two, or however many, however many students are coming to campus. So assuming that the disease starts from some seed, how will it spread, and what will what will be the maximum number of, or what will be the maximum percentage of uh, students who are infected? Okay, so that's what COVID back to school does. And then the question became, okay, so that's nice. So we we can answer the question: How many students are coming to school infected? And we can answer the question: How is that going to uh, uh, evolve? How is the infection going to evolve? Now, can we quantitatively analyze various strategies? Such as you know masks, wearing masks or not wearing masks. How many? How 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 much interaction uh, is going on in the classes? And if we reduce class sizes, uh, what about uh, testing? Can we incorporate testing? And 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 this allows us to try out various strategies before actually implementing them to see what will work and what will not work. And that's the key value of COVID back to school. It allows you to try out various strategies figure out what works and what doesn't work. And then once you settle on a strategy, it allows you to see uh, how, will, how will the disease evolve given your strategy and, and then be comfortable, be, be sort of uh, have, 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 have some level of comfort that at, at the quantitative models are saying things are under control. And the, so the COVID back to school, I believe, is sort of, you know, how, how uh, RPI at the high level decided on you know that that so 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 while it while it was while it was conjectured that maybe three days every three days testing or every seven days testing or every fourteen days testing while it was conjectured that these kinds of strategies would work by using COVID back to school you know RPI could 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 sort of see that quantitatively yes things were under control and you know uh, uh, infections would stay below one percent. Um, um, providing the, 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 these strategies were implemented. Where is COVID back to school now? Who can benefit from it? Right now, COVID war room and COVID back to school have actually been deployed as fully fledged uh, uh, online web apps. So anybody can go to covidwarroom.idea.rpi.edu and covidspread.idea.rpi.edu and make use of these tools. So we're hoping that, you know, the next phase of reopening, which is going to be coming in uh, in January, um, we're hoping that schools can, all, all schools have COVID back to school available uh, and they can use it. And they can, at, le at the very least, they can use it to sort of evaluate what their current strategies will look like, assuming that an infection were to start. And uh, hopefully even better, they can use it to improve and optimize their strategies, such as uh, figure out what's the optimal testing frequency given, let's say, uh, a, a financial budget of testing. You know what? You know how important is it to enforce masks? Uh, how important is it to sort of shrink the class sizes or, or elongate the uh, or spread out the classes through the day and so on and so forth? So this is a publicly now available tool, and uh, you know we're hoping that uh, schools can use it to open safely at schools at all levels in the uh, in the uh, education system. Next, we'll hear from a material scientist about how the unique model he put together with a colleague is being used by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Tori Wells has more. Young Fang Shai is an associate professor of material science and engineering at Rensselaer, 
I recently spoke with him about a unique COVID-19 transmission model he developed that was inspired by gas phase chemistry. The model is helping the CDC forecast COVID-19 transmission across the country. Professor Shai, can you talk about how and why you developed this model? Right. So it all started when I talked to my collaborator, Jeff Ban, uh, who used to be at RPI, and then he moved to University of Washington. He's a specialist in uh, civil engineering, uh, specifically transportation. Uh, so he knows a lot about mobility of the society, uh, traffic. Um, so we were talking about you know, how to forecast the COVID-19, you know, uh, how, how can we control it? Um, so then I'm, I'm thinking about some simple chemical reaction analog to, to forecast uh, COVID-19. And uh, what, we, what we are needing is uh, how do we account for the chemical reaction rate, which in society would be uh, the mobility or the traffic. And he is, a, he is an expert on this. So we, we started to, to, to talk and, uh, and I come up with a little model and uh, then uh, we sort of implemented. And uh, we first implemented for New York City. And uh, I still remember the day I just used Excel to you know, try out um, and I grabbed the Google mobility data and uh, it works extremely well. So all the data fit on the straight line as the model predicted. And I understand you're now sharing that model with the CDC each week, along with dozens of other research teams across the country. Can you explain how that works? So the idea is that uh, it assembles all the different models of forecasting Mm -hmm. and they get an averaged, uh, they call it ensemble averaged uh, forecast presumably will be better. So we participated by uh, essentially extending our work on counties, uh, extending that to states. So we model, you know, all, um, I think 30-ish state. For smaller state, we just lump sum it into a, you know, one super small state to do the modeling. And then uh, we participated since the starting of August. Uh, so we participated for eight weeks already. So we had a weekly teleconference with uh, all the modelers uh, do COVID-19 modeling. So we are kind of uh, different because we are not sort of uh, uh, infectious disease modelers. Uh, There are a lot of uh, uh, people doing flu forecast and so on and so forth. That's sort of their field. Uh, I'm a sort of a computational physicist, computational material scientist. And Jeff is a you know civil engineer. So so basically, my model essentially can be understood as follows. Basically, if you go to grocery store once a week, your your chance of getting infected will be um, essentially four times. If you go to grocery store four you know one times a month, that that's it. So essentially, um, the, the data we're using is called the Google Mobility. This is a uh, open data that Google assembled, um, it arranged in six categories of, uh, say, transit stations, workplace, uh, parks, okay. uh, retail, and uh, pharmacy, so on and so forth. There are six categories. Uh, and uh, essentially, it, it records how many visits uh, for a particular location that has a county level uh, data every day. And uh, we basically use that data. So. Essentially, if you visit, if, if the if the traffic essentially right, the number of visits uh, increases, then the overall transmission will be high. So the reason why, uh, remember back in March and April, New York is the hotbed, is the worst um, uh, hit uh, place, is because uh, we have an outbreak, and how do we control it? It is completely scientific. It's because we stayed home. Mm-hmm. That's it. We stayed home. So we killed off all the possible contact, school closed, so on and so forth. That's why the infection drops. Why the infection drops is because people naturally recover. So basically, um, a, a very important conclusion from our preprint is that we need to stay at a relatively low uh, mobility in order for it not to outbreak. And I assume it's your hope that this model will help guide policymakers. Yes. 
So uh, as an attempt, uh, you can see our website. So that website has a few options. Let's say if you implement with school opening and if you mandate mask, if you shut down, our prediction is on fatality. The fatality will not show up until a month later. So you implement a, a two week shutdown, it will, you will not see the effect until you know, next month, basically. We want to use the model to give the local government some uh, concrete predictive insight uh, to implement certain, certain policies of, of lockdowns or masks and so on and so forth. What encourages you most about this work? I think uh, there's no there's no mystery of of why there's outbreak. There's no mystery of why we controlled it. So the the, the science is absolutely there, and uh, we we just need the scientific guidance in implementing policies at the local level. You know, the county, state, and the federal level. Obviously, there's a lot of work that goes into doing these models each week. What keeps you going? I think it's just that want to help. This is no different than we uh, we volunteer for you know for whatever reason. This is not uh, uh, that hard, uh, or it is uh, dragging me down. I mean, I'm I'm interested in knowing what's gonna happen in uh, for four weeks. You know, not only to to kind of uh, disseminate this you know forecast, this this knowledge to you know the community. But also to my friends, to you know, for my family, I, I want to know, you know, is it safe to go to school, you know, for my kid, right? You know, it's, uh, uh, so it's it's uh, it's quite uh, natural. This episode of Why Not Change the World was recorded remotely due to the ongoing COVID nineteen pandemic. Information on Magdan Ismail's modeling program, COVID Back to School, can be found at COVID Spread. Dot idea dot rpi dot edu. His COVID War Room is at covidwarroom.idea.rpi.edu. Young Feng Shai's model can be accessed at rpi-uw-covid-mobility.herokuapp.com. Please take a moment to rate this podcast on whatever app you're on. And if you'd like to learn more about what's happening at Rensselaer, visit rpi.edu. Thanks for listening.